So first of all, I'd like to actually welcome everybody in. Uh, this is Margaret Ross from um, Hampshire Branch, and also we have uh, Chris Lawrence from, oh. from the South London, um, and we have also uh, organising this event, um, Sussex Branch and Dorset Branch and BCS Women. And it's a rather special day for women today because it is the International uh, Girls in ICT Day, so this is very appropriate. So we are extremely lucky that uh, Dorothy has very kindly uh, agreed to make the presentation. What we are going to do is record the session and the recording will be put onto the appropriate place in the website for this event, uh, together with a copy of Dorothy's slides. And what we will actually do is ask everybody to keep muted and we will actually also cut our pictures once we actually get started again. Now, I'm going to let, uh, we're not going to take any questions during, uh, but if you could put it into the chat area, and Chris will be keeping an eye on the, the chat area that comes through. Uh, one thing that's very special about Dorothy is the honorary FBCS. Now, there's a considerable number of fellows of the British Indian Society, but there's only about 150 honorary FBCS. And of those, there's only about seven that are women. So uh, Dorothy became honorary FBCS about um, a year ago, or just yeah. over, and uh, was, I think, about the sixth or seventh woman ever to achieve this in approximately 70 years. So we, we were very, very um, pleased about this. Now, at that stage, I'm going to cut my camera and my microphone and probably ask other people also to cut their um, camera as well. Uh, and I also noticed, by the way, to welcome uh, other people to actually do today as well as the BCS ones. So in which case, I pass across to Dorothy and look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Okay, so hello and good afternoon to everybody. It's a nice day today, certainly in Guildford. Um, the sun is shining and looking very nice. Um, I'll, I'll just talk to you today a bit about uh, my journey into the area I'm working in now and talk to you a bit about, give some information about my research projects, my work, um, which I think is very exciting. So hopefully you'll find it equally exciting. Currently, just before I talk about um, how I came to it, just I'm currently professor of computer science at Leeds Beckett University in Leeds. I'm principal investigator on a number of projects um, around the area of smart cities and health, health technologies. I'm on several advisory boards um, in the UK and overseas. One that's particularly interesting to me is an inclusion matters. Um, research council funded project and, and it's interesting, it's very exciting because it has to do with um, how do we encourage and how do we improve the experience of underrepresented groups in STEM, so in, in science, technology, engineering, mathematics subjects at university um, research level and so it's a very exciting project. I'm also, I also have a commercial hat. So when I'm not um, in the university, I work as a chief technical um, officer in a company. Um, the company has nothing to do with technology. So my role is actually looking at how we can use technology to improve their services, improve their, their productivity and so on. And that's a very exciting uh, um, piece of work I do. I also, every now and again, I'm called upon as a, as a consultant in digital health. So how did it all start? Um, as far back as I can remember, I always wanted to know about how things work. Um, to the annoyance of my parents, I was always opening up things, trying to figure out how they work. And when I was very little, I obviously couldn't put things back together. So you'd have a, um, see a radio set dismantled. But those of us who remember radios, radios a radio set dismantled, uh, but I was too young to be able to put it back. But as time progressed, um, I was able to start putting things back. And I started wanting to build my own things. 
um, some of the things I was really, really excited about, and one some I'm still excited about, one is uh, aeroplanes and the jet engine. And I always found that to be the most amazing thing. I could spend hours just watching planes uh, um, take off and land. I was lucky enough to live in a, in a place where in a city where I could get to the airport and watch planes take off and land. And you'd be amazed. You'd be amazed how much how many hours I spent doing that. Um, other things that piqued my attention when I was very little were TV sets. Uh, how did they work? You know, um, so opened up one to find out how it worked. And that's obviously brought me to, um, as a teenager, decided to study engineering. Um, and that was essentially the start of my career in, in, in sort of technology. Um, having said that, if there are two things that had to characterize my um, early days, um, undergraduate and, and sort of and, and well, just before undergraduate, is essentially computers. And I have an old style computers because, um, in a sense, I was lucky to come by at a time where um, it was just the first personal computers were coming by, where you could actually have a computer at home. Um, obviously, they were still relatively expensive, but you could you could possibly have one. And, and the first thing I did save up everything I could save it, save up every penny I could find to get myself a computer. At that point, I decided I wanted to build my own computer. It wasn't good enough to have somebody else's computer. So the first thing I realized I needed was an oscilloscope. And that's why I have an oscilloscope as the one of the second one of the, of the items that really um, defined um, what I do today. Um, so I had to build my oscilloscope because oscilloscopes are very expensive and you can't, and so I couldn't afford one. So I had to build one from scratch, uh, which I did, which taught me quite a lot. And at that point, I decided I wanted to be an engineer, and I went to study engineering at university. Um, it was really, um, I was lucky enough because when I studied engineering, I was also quite interested in, in astronomy and astrophysics and took us um, optional courses on those. And so when I finished, I decided to um, go into satellite engineering, and that's where I did as while I was working, I was also studying um, a master's in satellite engineering and a, and a PhD doctorate in spacecraft engineering. So my early career started in um, satellite engineering, building satellite systems. And specifically, I was mad about computers. So I was building computer systems for for satellites, and these are these are two pictures of the early satellites. And um, the company I work for is really really unique in the sense that, in in those days, and even still today to now, um, apart from very large corporation, very large companies building satellites, um, there were nobody else was, there was nobody else doing it. And and we had this uh, um, very um, visionary, um, actually, it's a professor at the university who decided to build satellites. And I joined um, the company uh, and we used to build um, satellites, small satellites like the ones you see in the pictures. Um, I was um, working, I was in charge of the onboard computers. So essentially they're just computers, but they onboard the satellite and they sort of control the satellite as they spin around as, as they sort of go around Earth. Um, but the one thing about um, the, all the work I did was, uh, um, if you think about whether it's a computer on your desk or a satellite system, computers in the satellite system, they are essentially just executing a series of code uh, um, and stupidly just doing so. I was really intrigued by um, systems that could think for themselves, if you could say that. And that's why at some point I decided to do to see how I can combine. Um, I found out about artificial intelligence, the, the, the discipline, the topic, and decided to try and combine um, artificial intelligence with what I was doing. And that's how it all started, the whole journey in artificial intelligence. The first step was to um, go to uh, um, JPL, so NASA in California, and so working with the group in, in um, artificial intelligence so, um, to, to, to um, develop smarter um, satellite and spacecraft. When I came back to the UK, um, I worked 
at the same company for a while. Um, I was so young, they got also young um, on, on again on, on the ball computers. You can see me in the lab doing some work. Um, some of them were probably looking at the testing um, some of the ball computers just prior to, to launch. Um, but then after a while, deciding to go back to, to, to academia uh, as a researcher to do pure, um, um, pure research rather than commercial research. And while I was there, um, when, I first, when I first went back to academia, one of the things that I sort of realized, I wanted to work with, yes, satellites were great, spacecraft were great, but work with technology that affects um, people directly on Earth. Not to say that uh, um, satellites don't affect, because if you think about it, uh, um, the mobile phone that everybody uses um, is thanks to um, satellite uh, engineering. But I got interested in health. And one of the things I found out is that all the algorithms, all the things I'd learned in space, AI in space systems, they were exactly the same and applicable to, to what is health systems, so health care technologies uh, and so on. So it wasn't far. I didn't have to even relearn anything. It was just a different area where I was applying uh, um, um, what I'd learned before. And, and again, always concerned with how you can make things more clever and automated. You know, I decided um, I went into the area of smart homes and proceeded to make my home as smart as possible and sort of learn from me. But the goal wasn't just for smart home for the sake of smart home, it's smart home for the sake of trying to help the person um, live. So if you imagine you have mobility issues or if you have um, cognitive issues, how can your home actually help you be more independent? And that's the angle, that, that, that was my perspective and it still is my perspective. And, and I like to joke about it, but secretly I, I, I look forward to the day where we have uh, um, robots <laughs> that can look after us. And I certainly hope that when I get to the stage where I need looking after, I'd have a robot to be looking after me, um, like in the film, uh, um, Frank and, and the robot. Um, talking of which, they're becoming more and more human-like. So um, that can be scary but it also means that you can probably have robot companions and not just mechanical things, the mechanical robotic uh, um, beings that do something for us. We'd actually have some human companionship, but that's a far away. And I think for now I would settle for a home, a home that looks like a standard home, but has enough um, sensors and, and algorithms to look after, to help look after me. But coming down to more mundane stuff, I, I do quite a lot of research in healthcare and other areas. So a lot of the work I do now is in assistive technologies and rehabilitation technologies. Uh, and one of the one of the main research pro projects at the moment uh, uh, um, is we developing a, a rehabilitation system for stroke survivors. I'll say more a bit about it. Um, so the whole idea is, is that we call it the virtual physiotherapist. Um, the, the whole idea is the post-stroke, um, um, I'm sure medical people, if there are any uh, among, among yourselves, among the, the audience um, will know better than I do, post-stroke, you suffer from paralysis, weakness, and so on. And, and, and there's no cure on the main thing you can do, the only way you can manage it is usually physiotherapy uh, for the physical um, problems. And we know that in the UK, uh, um, there's a limited available availability of physiotherapists. It's quite expensive. It's time consuming, there's travel and so on. So, so quite often, and one of the things you read in, in sort of research papers the work that have been studied quite well is that there is a recommended amount of physio that somebody recovering from stroke should should ideally get, but many people in the UK actually get that recommended uh, amount. And uh, so one of the things you're hoping to do is that with a system that, that um, you can use at home under supervision or without supervision at all to help you go through your physio exercises. And you can see from the examples in, in this uh, um, slide that some of the exercises are 
quite, for somebody who is quite able-bodied, they're quite simple uh, um, to, to do. So those are sort of things you capture in our system. And what essentially you do, the first prototype you see here is, some of you may recognize a kinet. So that's the first prototype. It, it looks at the motion. See, if you're moving your arm, it tracks your arm and analyzes the motion and measures it um, against a reference. The reference could be yourself a few days ago, yes. So hopefully you can see progress. Now, the latest system is a lot more advanced than this and doesn't use the Kinet. Um, we are hoping to commercialize it sometime this year, at least to start the, the, the process um, later this year. Um, you can work with a, a, a physio, a clinician remotely at the hospital or somewhere, um, so under supervision, or you could work alone. Um, Talking of automation, um, my Alexa device thought I was talking to her <laughs> and, and I was asking me a question. Um, so so it, it's, it, it's, it's a device that you can use either standalone um, and it will look at your, your, your movement. So track your movement, assess how well you're doing the movement and collect information and can transfer, um, transmit that information to your doctor. So it's, so it's, so it's textual information that's transmit, but you could also have equally have a video, um, like a video conferencing uh, um, session with a physio who is at the hospital or somewhere. Um, one thing um, we find when you're developing it is that how do we give feedback? Um, there's, so there are two aspects. One is feedback in terms of how well you, 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 um, the person is, is, is achieving, performing the, the movement. And the second one is, is, is more of a, of a psychological encouragement because a lot of people, um, you've just had a stroke, um, you're probably quite depressed, your motivation is low and so on. And so part of the system is, it's, is uh, aside from assessing movement, it's also about how can you encourage people to continue and, and be sort of a, a, a motivational. So these are areas we, we kind of looked at. Um, this is a very simple uh, um, look at, 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 at track movement tracking. Anybody who's seen uh, uh, some of the game devices will recognize something similar, although we, we have improved accuracy so that we can actually measure and assess um, more, more correctly. Um, here's one of my students in the early phases trying out um, the device for me. As I said, motivation is probably one of the most difficult things to uh, to, to address because from a research point of view, because it, it's it's not just, you know, you're, now you're moving into more of the psychological uh, um, arena and we sort of had to bring in um, our psychology um, collaborate, um, um, colleagues to sort of help us understand and try and, uh, and, and try and help us, how can you design? But the other thing I mustn't forget to say is that all along we are working with, we've been working with doctors, but more importantly, we've worked with stroke survivors. And I think the biggest help and the best thing you can do when you're developing assistive technology and any healthcare technology, the best thing you can do really is to be working with the, the, the people with lived experience because there's nothing you can, there's so much that they can tell you about what you're doing that's wrong and, and guide you that some things that you can, as an engineer, um, no matter how clever you are, you could not possibly have known so that's the very key thing is working with the, the, the people who've lived the experience of whatever the, the, the challenge you're, you're addressing. And it doesn't matter what technology it is. Um, so we tried we tried to use so various gamifications. This is ongoing and early phases and how can we motivate people? But obviously people are very different. What, what motivates somebody doesn't necessarily motivate um, somebody else, and this is a part that's changing the most in, in, in the latest version that we've completely revamped and, and so trying to bring in new ideas with um, end users and psychologists. Um, I, I just want to tell you a bit more about other projects. Um, although the uh, virtual physio is the main project at the moment, there are quite a few other things uh, um, we've been doing. And some of the areas, I'm looking at 
So I just um so somebody is working with clinicians. Um we are looking at um how can we um assess um Parkinson disease, patients with Parkinson disease. Um, so, so we've been working with a, a, a glove, essentially is monitoring the hand, how they grasp uh, an object such as a glass uh, and so on to try and sort of establish, to provide a tool for a clinician to actually sort of um, um, determine how well the patient or, or rather the progress of the disease, because typically um, our clin clinical collaborator, he will see his patients every six months or so. And in between, he has no idea what's going on. Um, so essentially, we're trying to find tools that the patient can be using at home, gathering information that will be transmitted back to the clinician, to the consultant. And he can have a, a view so that when he sees his patient every six months, it's not just what they are. He's not just looking at the patient on the day that they come in, but he actually has an idea of what's been going on um, over, the, over the past six months. Um, this work was carried out um, with a, 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 a consultant in Cordedale Hospital. Um, it's still ongoing. Another project, sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction. Another um, project, again, a consultant looking at dementia triage. Now, what uh, um, Peter, a consultant, sees is that lots and lots of people are passing through his clinic every day with um, um, possible uh, or suspected uh, um, early stage. And, from, and they tend to be referred by the GP because of some memory issues. Uh, so he's got quite a lot. And obviously like, like any, any sort of clinic in the NHS, uh, uh, um, there are limited resources. And so you're looking at, at how can we provide a tool to support triage because a lot of the time the memory issues could be about depression it could be about any number of other things that are not at all related to dementia and have nothing to do with dementia so you need a, he's sort of looking for if you're looking for tools that can sort of help him uh, and triage so he can send because the other thing is that also once he sends once he once he's, he's done an initial test, if he thinks that there's a pot potential, then he'll send them on for more expensive tests. And, and so in order to, to sort of cut down on, on that one, on the number of people, but also I'm um, reducing the number who will be unnecessarily sent for, uh, um, for further tests. If you had a tool to help with, with the triage. Interestingly enough, this came up because when we were working on the Parkinson's, we found out that some of the tests he uses as part of his triage are quite similar to, the, to what um, uh, um, um, was, was being used in, in Parkinson's um, case in terms of, um, from a computational point of view, the, the glove, using a glove, a smart glove, uh, and the measurements that we could take were quite similar. So it just seemed uh, um, quite natural to, to also include this project. Um, one, this project actually is, the, the next project I'll talk about is actually on hold now um, for a number of reasons, partly um, because of the pandemic, but also because uh, and we came to an, a, a decision. Essentially, what happened is that talking to um, Leeds City Council, they run a large number of care homes, so homes for, for the elderly, and also some are especially some for people with dementia. But they also have a, um, um, the number of private care homes to which they, they refer uh, um, people from the Leeds area. And one of the things we, they found is that a lot of those homes are use very little technology. Some of them are completely um, people based in terms of care records and, and absolutely no technology whatsoever. And, so, and quite a lot of them we found actually had the technology in the home, whether it's technology for care records, so basically computer systems with, with appropriate software. And some even had telehealth and telecare systems, but unused. And the whole idea was to go in and see how we can facilitate or create a system that makes it easy for carers to record um, their care, to create the care records at the end of the day, because a lot of them were saying, oh, we just don't have time and so on. But what we found when we were running an audit of the care homes in Leeds, a few of them in Leeds, we found that 
a lot of the problems was, was, was question of um, digital confidence. Digital literacy, probably less so, but certainly digital confidence. And a lot of the time they would say they don't have time and so on because there wasn't that familiarity with the computer system, with, with the telecare and telehealth system. So in a sense, the, the recommendation I made was simply that before we could proceed with this, adding yet another layer of technology would be to make sure that the staff are trained and, and sort of um, dig digitally um, confident uh, uh, and, and to use any technology. Um, one of the projects, another project working on as brain injury patients with a consultant who wanted to monitor um, the extent to which um, um, activity um, um, helps recovery of brain injury patients. And this was um, a, a hospital in Hull with people, it was a broad, they all was, had brain injury, but for various reasons, anything from accidents, uh, um, so car accidents to other sort of trauma. And the whole idea is to sort of just monitor, uh, um, it's quite exploratory and monitor activity and see how they can, um, uh, um, if it had any co correlate with um, recovery. So you can see there are many uses of technology uh, uh, in various areas of health. Now, as well as working with the NHS and consultants in the NHS, you have, I work with commercial companies, um, looking at very specific um, projects, very pro specific products they want to develop, and they're looking for me to support um, the R&D, the innovation in, in these in these pro products. And quite often, this is paid for by um, Innovatigay uh, um, um, funding. One example was early on was a smart mattress. Um, as you may know, um, somebody who is um, bedridden and in bed for long days at a time will end up suffering from bed sores. So we were developing a smart mattress that not only uh, um, um, looks at, detects the pressure, so it looks at the pressure points as the person is lying down, but automatically can shift around the patient. Normally the shifting around will be done by a nurse who just move there, be moving the patient uh, um, regularly. So this is, is a mattress that actually automatically detects pressure points and shifts the patient around regularly throughout the day. So this is a local co company local to, to Leeds. Um, another project with company in, in the sort of Yorkshire area, um, um, for those of you who don't know, people who use um, heavy um, um, drilling equipment, like the sort you find when you see people repairing um, roads, they use very heavy uh, uh, pneumatic drills. What can result is, is what's called um, renal syndrome or white fingers, where there's a loss of blood, loss of nerve and function in the ends of the tips of the fingers and can result in some of the pictures you see. Um, so the idea was to use um, normally health and safety requirement that you don't use the equipment for X number of, of, of hours or minutes at a time. So you have to take a rest and so on. But it's difficult when people are in, in the doing sort of the work on whether it's on the roads, on the railways and so on, and, and the pressure, time pressure is to finish the job. They may not necessarily follow those um, health and safety guidelines. And sometimes it is, it's not intentional, you just forget. So this is a system where you place devices on the, on the machine so that you can actually measure the amount of the dose received exposure. Because obviously exposure, amount of exposure relates to the, the, the risk of, of, of this uh, um, renal syndrome. So you have devices that measure the, the, the sort of exposure received and can automatically switch off um, the device. But also it means that all the exposure is actually measured and stored in a cloud so that, um, um, so that later on you can sort of um, look, look at it and see who has been exposed and, and by how much and so on. Another project was with a company looking at, at um, telecare systems for um, care homes. So you can see it's a quite a varied number of um, project different areas. I, is, but one thing they all have in common, if you look at the electronics and the algorithms, they're pretty much the, the same. 
and they just apply to different things and, and, and different domains and different sort of application areas. So I've, I tend to find this sort of work very exciting. I quite enjoy commercial work because it also means that you get to see um, somebody using whatever you built um, rather than academic work quite often you do a piece of work you write a, a journal a paper for a journal you publish in a journal paper ends up in libraries or around the world but you never see um, anybody using whatever it is whereas when you're doing commercial work the exciting part is actually getting to see people using whatever system you've developed um, I enjoy working with engineers and scientists, try and help, help them develop their skills. I find that very enjoyable. Um, I, I quite enjoy working with researchers, postdoctoral um, and postdoctoral researchers. Um, I also quite enjoy, for example, now I also spend a lot of time in companies. So I, I recruit for placements, um, project work based on company needs. So the students are actually doing developing systems or whether software or hardware that are actually be used directly in the company. I organize hackathons, um, which are essentially over a, whole, a, a weekend. We have a theme um, this last year, um, it's the October 2020. The theme was um, technologies to support mental health. And it is run for all the students in Leeds, so it's Leeds Beckett, Leeds University, Leeds Trinity, and any college. So students get a, a weekend to um, um, develop a piece of hardware, and and somebody, and the winner gets a prize at the end at the end on Sunday. Usually the prize is anything between a thousand pounds and five thousand pounds, depending on how much support we have. Um, last year, because of the pandemic. The hackathons run online, uh, which actually made it quite interesting. Um, and it would be stretched stretch it out over a week. Normally, a hackathon will start on Friday, will start on Friday afternoon, where we present, we talk about the theme, you know, the expectations and so on, and, and the presentation of price happens on Sunday night, Sunday evening. And we provide space to work throughout the weekend, to sleep throughout the weekend if necessary, sleep on campus. And we provide the food, the drinks and everything to keep them going so they don't even have to go home if they, do not, if they wish to stay. So I find those quite exciting and look forward to, the, to having one every year. I'll stop here and wait to see if you have any questions. Thanks very much for listening. That, that was a marvellous uh, presentation. Thank you so much.